folks tell me, how can a known poison that exists in our food supply or medications, and sometimes even in the air you breathe, be totally overlooked as the cause of disease in America? Watch me now and soon you too will know the cause. What a day yesterday was. I jumped in last night, I'm batching it. Uh, my wife is in Hill Country and uh, I'm batching it. So the cat and I uh, sat on the couch and answered a bunch of questions last night. I wish I had more time to do that. I wish I could, I've said this a lot of times and I really mean it. Understand, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a pharmacist, I'm not a nurse. Um, I'm a guy who learned, who was, who was bent on learning why I had the most bizarre health problems. I don't even want to expound on them because many of you know in the past three, four years I've been talking about this. <clears throat> why was I having these? I went to Vietnam, one guy, and I came back a different guy. And it was built into the brains of people I would see that, well, you have post-traumatic. We did, 50 years ago, there wasn't a post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD. <clears throat> it's relatively new. And we now know that trauma at, a, at any age can induce a lot of health problems. Folks, I think a lot of the health problems you're having, we'll talk about this today, are centered around your fear of the unknown. What in the world has happened to America? What has happened? How could anyone think everything's okay? I'm not one of those guys that thinks everything is okay. But what I wanted to do, since I couldn't find, uh, uh, let's see, who was it? Uh, Parmela's question. I couldn't find uh, Brandy's question and all the questions I get. There are hundreds of, of inquiries and comments. Thank you so much. I, I printed them. I'm going to address them now. And then I've already sent, today I sent uh, uh, Brandy a couple of books. The, the woman's book that you see behind me is the newest book. And then the diet guide, I revised the diet guide right after I did the woman's book because things are changing. I know about you know different cheeses and, and uh, things that I learned through the years. Anyone who at 21 years old thinks you got the answer because you're a registered dietitian is sorely mistaken. Nutrition is not static. Your body is not static. Science is not static. It is moving and shaking all the time, okay? So let me, uh, before I go to what I wanted to talk about, let me address Brandy. And John, thank you. I didn't see that when you brought that out, but John wrote urgent on this. I jumped on your video in the middle, so I missed a good bit. I would love to complete a, uh, I would love a complete program to help me. I have hypothyroidism, kidney disease, adrenal disease, a nodule on my lung, extreme fatigue in my body to the point I'm bedridden, and now something has triggered my eyesight not to see images as a single image. The blurry and double vision keeps getting wor worse. Nothing I've ever done has helped me lose weight either. I'm so overwhelmed and lost. Please help. And so I'm going to. Um, through the years, I have sent out free books. And it distresses me so when I do that and people put it in a box to take it to half price books and give it away. Uh, I'm doing this out of the kindness of my heart, Brandy. And what I want you to do <clears throat> is raise your right hand. I swear, when I get the two books Doug Kaufman is sending me, I will read them twice and will try and work with a healthcare provider in my area, and I know where she lives, I, I sent them to her address, to help me overcome these problems I'm having. Fun cancer metastasizes through your body, dangerous. Fungus metastasizes through your body. It's called dissemination. But cancer disseminates through your body. Same thing, metastasis and dissemination. <clears throat> so, Brandy, help is on the way. It'll be there in a couple of days. If you want help, you have to do it yourself. I can send you some books. I would love for you to find a nurse at church, a chiropractor in your condo association. I'd love for you to find someone, a nutritionist, to help you through this. And better yet, a loved one to follow the program with you. With all of these symptoms going on, Brandy, what's happening? You're young. What's happening? And that's what you're asking me. 
folks, when there are multiple symptoms, we call these polysymptomatic patients. Poly means many, many symptoms. The only study in the scientific literature that I can find dates back 25 years. They took a group of polysymptomatic patients. Hey, Doug, I have kidney disease, adrenal disease, I'm gaining weight, extreme fatigue, hypothyroidism. Point to an area in your body. It's gone awry. You know what helped? They put half of these, I don't know, 100 people on a placebo, and they put the other half on a drug called Nystatin. And guess what happened? You got it. You're smart. You're watching this show. The Nystatin was a home run. All Nystatin does is kill yeast. Okay? <clears throat> so I'm sorry you're having these problems. You will get a very early Christmas gift from me, and uh, I really, I really hope you're on your way to getting better. How long do I think it'll take? Worst time of the year, Brandy, to talk to Doug Kaufman. And that's something I'm going to talk about also in just a minute. Uh, Parmala said, I never commented, but I've listened often. I'm 57 and having chronic urinary tract infections. I don't want to take Cipro again. Can I just tell you one thing? The word again blows me away. The definition of insanity is doing something repetitively and believing it's finally going to start working. And yet, 190 million Americans are taking blood pressure drugs and stat, don't stop them, and statin drugs, yada, 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 believing that it's sometime, I'm sure the doctor has had the talk with people who take medications. You're not going to get better taking those medications, womb to tomb. You're going to be on those medications to stabilize. This is called, folks, another word I don't like. We're going to help you maintain your health. Um, but, but when she says, I don't want to take Cipro again, I surmise from that you have taken Cipro a lot and you still have UTIs. And if you went to another urologist, another OBGYN, another uh, doctor, internist, you get another Cipro. That's what they do, okay? So, I, again, I covered this in the, in the female book. <clears throat> if I had, and men get bad chronic urinary tract infections, wasn't Bill Clinton just in a hospital at UC Irvine, I know right where that is, that hospital, out in uh, California because of a urinary tract infection. And I'm going to go places the doctors haven't gone with you, okay? Number one, we need to address this question, Parmala. Are we passing this back and forth? You see, dermatophytes on the skin of a male aren't going to bother him at all, okay? But once they're in a 98.6 degree environment, they can rapidly multiply, swell, induce inflammation, itching, horrible symptoms, okay? Are we passing this back and forth? What I used to counsel people at the hospital uh, that I worked with those doctors, I used to tell men and women, and use a barrier, prevent skin-on-skin -skin contact during intimacy. We're all intimate with our spouses, love that. Uh, it's very important that you understand you may be passing this back and forth. And the one thing I found, I don't want to point to any one thing, but the one thing I found over and over when questioning uh, men and women with urinary tract infections was alcohol. I don't know, does alcohol ooze out on our skin and then we pass mycotoxins back and forth, ethanol back and forth? I, I don't know the answer to that. But if there is a history of a glass of wine here and there, stop it for a month. You know what I'm talking about, Parmela. Um, this is a miserable situation. So that's number one. Are we passing this back and forth? Just assure for a month that you aren't. It's only going to take a month, the diet, follow the Kaufman diet. <clears throat> the other thing I want you to consider is this. Uh, folks, there's a line in the sand between abusing antibiotics the way we are in medicine, because we're letting them. We don't know. We didn't go to medical school. And what they learned is everything gets an infection, itis, antibiotic, antibiotic, antibiotic. Pull out of your pocket, write an antibiotic all day. And they believe that we're becoming insensitive to these antibiotics. They believe we've taken so many, well, tisk, tisk. They can't handle any more antibiotics. What I believe is 
they're treating the wrong organism. They're treating the wrong pathogen. I think many people with UTIs or vaginal yeast infections are fungus. Sometimes they're bacterial. But the point I want to make is Cipro doesn't work, Doc. Antibiotics aren't working. Okay, thanks, John. Oh, wow, thank you, Debbie. You're a godsend. <clears throat> They don't get it. They're really smart. They don't have any idea why we're becoming antibiotic resistant. Well, lots of people are becoming, and it can kill them. Because when a real bacterial infection happens, not a pseudo-bacterial infection like yeast or fungi, when a real bacterial infection comes along, look at your chart, mm, boy, this person can't take antibiotics. What are we going to do? This is why I love herbs. This is why I just love the things you can get in the health food store. And I'm heavy on them. I take a lot of them. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, so two things to consider. If this is a yeast, and the doctor will give you, it, would it be yeast or would it be fungi dermatophyte? Probably yeast. I would ask for 200 milligram diclucan, for five days while I'm on the Kaufman program for a month. So the first five days, I'm telling you, you should feel if this is yeast and it's being treated as, oh gosh, the problems we get into. You know what yeast loves? Mycotoxins. I mean, it's so amazing to me. So we give them antibiotics. Any women have vaginal yeast infections and you've been on three or four rounds of antibiotics and boom, igniting, horrible. And the doctor gives you one 150 milligram diflucan because that's the therapeutic dose. Sometimes it works. It'll knock it out like that. I would ask the doctor for five 200 milligrams of diflucan. I would follow the Kaufman program as though it were a religion for a month, uh, I would make sure we're not passing this back and forth. You can't know, you can't know how many men and women I helped with that approach, okay? If an antibiotic doesn't work, doctors are trained to think, gee, let's give a different antibiotic. Because certainly this itis, urethritis, right, is due to a bacteria. How do you know, doc? Well, I did a urine test and there's bacteria in there. Did you test for yeast or aspergillus? No, no, I found bacteria. We learned in medical training, give lots of antibiotics. Okay, then I just got this from Debbie. Debbie, thank you so much. This is so timely. And Pramala, I hope you and Debbie talk. Doug had asked, uh, Doug had me ask my doctor for an antifungal for my UTIs. The doc agreed to and I haven't had one for two years now. I took one pill a week for three weeks. That would have been Diflucan, 150 milligram, Debbie. I saw this over and over, women crying, men not being able to sit down. The doctor thought it was a prostate problem. Whoops, sorry, we're wrong. They thought it was a bacterial problem. Whoops, sorry, that'll be $800. You guys. More than anything right now, I want you to think of the control you have, the power you have to help yourself get better. What have the last two years taught us? Follow the science. Another Cipro, another antibiotic. Gee, I don't know why now you have yeast growing in your ears. I can't figure it. Come on, let's get real. What they learned in medical training, we're now seeing settling. Drugs, 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 drugs. Common sense, not so much. Doctor, a ball peen hammer. A guy walks into a doctor and says, I'm having excruciating migraine headaches. And the doctor says, I'm going to give you a prescription for furanol. You inject it when the headache gets bad. Wrong. Stop hitting your head with a hammer. That kind of logic, folks, we don't see in medicine anymore. So what I'd like to do is all of you watching right now train you what I learned 50 years ago. I was desperate. I couldn't get on an elevator. I'm 21 years, 22 years old. Couldn't get on an elevator to go see Dr. Hughes where I was working. 
because my heart would beat out of its chamber. I'd sweat, my shirt would get wet, uh, and I was so paranoid, it was unbelievable. The point I want to make is, I probably saw stuff at 20 years old I shouldn't have. You all are seeing stuff right now for a year, that we pro or two years, that we probably shouldn't have. And it impacts us all differently. Cortisone elevation is different. The adrenals liberate a hormone. They're an endocrine gland. It's called cortisol. And it's a poison, I believe. The more cortisol you have, the shakier, you're out of control, you yell at your kids, you yell at your husband, because everything's not okay. I think it's going to be okay, but it's not okay. Okay? Did your patients, though, did they change their diet? Have you yeah. Eaten enough? She said she took one pill a week right. ago, but do you think she changed her diet on, on top of that? Uh, because Debbie's a, a listener, I, I would guess, Debbie, let John know, did you change your diet also? Um, the one... The one pill vaginal yeast cure, remember this AIDS, human immunovirus or uh, immune immunodeficiency drug called Diflucan, crossed the street uh, 20, 20 years, 25 years ago. And it became the one pill vaginal yeast cure. Now isn't that funny that we treated successfully, had a long run Diflucan helped AIDS patients. Wait a minute, that's a virus. You told me, Doug, Diflucan's an antifungal. A lot of this virus fungal stuff hanging around like yesterday. Wasn't that amazing? Did many of you read that? Well, it was too deep, wasn't it? Did many of you read the headline? It's, they're not going to let go of remdesivir. Folks, that's what, 4,000? They're not throwing that away. But they'll cleave it on to things like Prozac. I don't know how much Prozac is. It's got to be cheap. Or they'll cleave it on to Sporinox. Cheap. Now take your methotrexate, but take it with Sporinox. Which one works? Remsdesivir doesn't seem to work alone in many cases. And there's even question of it injuring the kidneys of people who took it. So let's cleave it on. Let's tell the patients two drugs are always better than one. Mark my words, before I die, people will be on three drugs for the same problem, for depression. That's the goal of the medical community. And they don't need new drugs. They just repurpose anti -fungal. Those of you who are watching this right now and saying, man, this is pretty incredible stuff. You will not find another blog. You will not find another show like this anywhere. I've looked. I wish you could have been this big and sat on my left shoulder while I was talking to eight. I kind of kept it to six to eight people a day. Once the doctors saw what we were capable of doing, they sent me a lot more than that, but then we had to schedule. I had an assistant, and she scheduled, she was awesome. She had to schedule the patients uh, for next Thursday. If you could only see when they came back in two weeks, just like Deb, they were so thankful, so happy, so overwhelmed. They emoted. Sometimes I felt like emoting. But had this, you see how God has worked in my life. Had this not happened to me in Vietnam, what in the world happened to my bowels? What's this bleeding all over my skin? Oh, it's called jungle rot. Well, jungle rot is a mycobacterium. To heck with bacterium. I hear myco. And so I thought, you know, gosh, okay, it's starting to make sense. Did that yeast, did that fungus get through my layers of skin into my bloodstream? That's the way I began thinking. Once I addressed that, problems went away. Problem was I was 21, 22. And for years thereafter, I would play the Friday night game. Go out with my roommates, have fun, drink, knowing full well I'd be constipated, my skin would break out, I'd feel miserable, um, and my symptoms would come back. That's okay when I was 26. Got married, started having kids, that's not okay then. Okay, so thank you so much, both of you. You're uh, Oh, and then Cindy, I wanted to tell you what Cindy said for Halloween. John, thank you for the pumpkin up there, by the way. This is a gentle reminder. I bought mechanical pencils. Can you imagine when we were 8 to 12 years old how much we'd hate going to Cindy's house? <laughs> Did you ever get graham cracker? <laughs> Bible. That, okay, listen to what Cindy says. I bought mechanical pencils, illuminating bracelets and necklaces, sugar-free gum, 
and I have some quarters on hand and a few Bibles to annoy the monsters. <laughs> uh, don't forget, kids really can't eat that much candy these days. So I put together, thanks, John. Um, Ola from Brisbane. Wow. Ola, Maria. Oh. Uh, God TV. This show is spreading wonderfully. Thank you. I put together a little presentation years ago, and I wanted to just read it to you because here's where we're going. And I hope Parmala is listening to this. Um, we now go, what is it, this Sunday night? We go from all these darling, the little ones are darling. Dad told me when he took Kathy and I out trick-or-treating, my older sister, that uh, we'd go to a house, this was uh, in Los Angeles, you know, we'd go trick-or-treat, and I'd sit on their porch, <laughs> unwrap the candy, and eat it. And he said, I couldn't pry you off that porch till you were done. Then we'd go to the next house, and Doug would sit down and eat it. Um, so I put together this, and I just want you to hear this to help you. This is on WebMD. WebMD is a medical website. When you read the labels on foods in your supermarket, it's no surprise that you find plenty of sugar in products like cake mixes, ice cream, jellies, cookies, and soda pop. But it can be downright shocking to see 12 grams of sugar in bottled pasta sauce or barbecue sauce. True, there's even more. And even more so to find 50 grams of sugar in a healthy-sounding bottled tea. I like WebMD for saying that. I mean, that's so true, folks. We think we're eating healthy. Healthy and natural are two words that are just batted back and forth like a ping pong ball. Healthy. It's natural. Don't worry, it's natural. Then, in 2016, 2016, five years ago, the year that um, both of the drugs we talked about yesterday, Spornox and, uh, and the other antifungal drug, were found to help cancer patients. In, 19, in 2016, over 32 million tons of sugarcane were produced in the U.S. 32 million tons. A ton is 2,000 pounds. 32 million tons of sugarcane were produced in the U.S. Uh, the world sugar production amounted to about 171 million metric tons in 2016, 2017, the world's largest sugar producer isn't even America. We're number 10. The world's largest sugar producer is Brazil. How much sugar do we Americans eat? Oh, and you saw what I typed in this morning, or this afternoon, on my Facebook feed. Do you like, do you ever watch Turner Classics? Watch some of those great 1930s, 1940s, 1950s movies. Uh, I love those. Everyone was rail thin except the banker and sometimes the doctor. See, because they could eat sugar. They had enough money, they could eat sugar. Sugar used to be a big deal. Uh, and it put weight on. 200 years ago, the average American ate two pounds of sugar a year. 1820. 1821, two pounds, two pounds of sugar a year. In 1970, that's the year I was in Vietnam, we ate 123 pounds of sugar a year. Today, and when was this done? 2016. Uh, today, the average American consumes almost 152 pounds of sugar in one year. This is equal to three pounds or six cups of sugar a week. And folks, you don't know, a medium potato. This is why it isn't on the Kaufman diet, right? A medium potato is what, a, a half a cup of sugar. Carbohydrates, breads, pastas, etc. It isn't just the white stuff. It's the carb carbohydrate content. <clears throat> and carbs are important, okay? Why do Americans take so many prescription drugs? About 70% of Americans are taking at least one medication daily, and people 65 to 79, that would be me, receive, oh, receive more than 27 
prescriptions for new drugs each year. That can't be right. And people aged, how many of you got, John? How many drugs are you on, 27? <laughs> Big zero goose egg. Can this be right? People aged 65 to 79 receive more than 27 prescriptions for new drugs each year. No, something's wrong there. Dietitians tell us we should eat only 6 to 12 teaspoons of sugar a day. That's probably reasonable. But Americans actually eat about one cup or 48 teaspoons of sugar a day. We are feeding fungus and fungus makes us swell and then we endure pain and we gain weight. And there's, there's a path I want to cross with you. <clears throat> Nancy Appleton, Dr. Nancy Appleton, great friend of mine when I lived in LA. She wrote a book on sugar. I read it. I don't know if I forwarded it. I can't even remember, but I, I uh, gave her a little hand with a wonderful woman. But the book blew me away. I mean, I got to tell you, when I was little, the most sugar I ate, except Halloween, was when my brother and I, dad took a job uh, with the state of California, and we all got free physicals. All, I think there were four of us, we kids then. And uh, we went to Kaiser, they were brand new, and they gave us physicals. And, uh, you know, uh, at any rate, in one room, Mark and I walk in, and there's just a tray with sugar cubes. We thought, it's got to be for coffee, right? So we went up, we started eating the sugar cubes. And we learned from a nurse who came in that uh, that was actually the polio vaccine. They put drops of the polio vaccine on. I will never get polio. We must eat four or five of those sugar cubes. And then the nurse came in and said, okay, this is a polio. We don't give it in shot. You can take it on a sugar cube. Mark and I have not had polio. We ate so many of those cubes. <clears throat> You do the math. If a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, one might logically conclude that the extra 48 teaspoons of sugar we eat each day would necessitate more and more prescription drugs to stop our swelling, inflammation, and our pain. Do, would we even need any medication if we cut way back to what our bodies were meant to consume in the 1930s and 40s or 200 years ago? Thanks, John. It begs the question, folks, we're eating way too much sugar. We're eating way too much sugar, and we're paying the price. So many of you, God bless you, so many of you are, are calling in and writing in and saying, Doug, I have this and this and this, and I'm going to always go with the big D, right, diet, because of what I learned, what I've been through. If it weren't for my past, I wouldn't be any good. If I grad, I was so angry I didn't go to medical school had every intention of doing that, but surfing and girls and, and Volkswagen vans came along and, you know, and my grades just, I wasn't ready to sit down and study as a doctor does uh, when you get through uh, or when you get into school. Once on board, fungi demand to be fed. Without sugar, they die. Fungus plus sugar plus medications equals doctors and hospitals. The system, no matter what you and I say, the system is working brilliantly. I want to read you before I go to your questions. I copied this today. MedPage, like WebMD, like other medical uh, news sites, is, are slanted. Okay, <clears throat> This is their COVID-19 update and other news. The CDC updated its guidelines to say that moderately or severely immunocompromised people who receive an additional dose of MNNR COVID vaccine may receive a booster at six months after that third shot. Number four. What do you think is going to happen six months after that? The 2020 election distracted the Trump team from curbing the pandemic, leaving more than 130,000 people to die unnecessarily. Former White House coronavirus response coordinator Deborah Burks, MD, told congressional investigators. Is in the Washington Post. While former Trump COVID advisor Scott Atlas, MD, slammed Burks for a testimony as Orwellian attempt to rewrite history. This is more than 3.8 billion people worldwide have received a dose of COVID-19 vaccine, about 50% of the global population. 
People with a history of severe allergic reactions to drugs and vaccines receive both doses of mRNA COVID-19 inoculation safely, says the study in the Journal of the American Medical Association. COVID unknown origins has reignited a contentious debate about the gain of function research. I think, boy, that's getting deep, isn't it? The puppy doc, that's getting deep. Get this, with Apple iOS 15.1 update, iPhone users can now add their COVID vaccine card to their Apple wallet. Here's another one. Amazon is putting its viral assistant Alexa next to patients' beds at Children's Hospital, Houston Methodist, and other hospitals. Okay, that's enough of that. I could go on and on. Let's have some fun. Let's try and help some of you get better here. Start at the beginning. Debbie, I really appreciate you uh, helping out with that testimonial. This uh, ERs are now swamped with seriously ill patients, NPR, but many don't even have COVID. Well, they have. And I, it's important that I read you a little bit of this, and I don't need to read it. Let me tell you, I've read it. The consensus medically is the reason, remember hospitals, they, they said hospitals didn't get back to normal till April of 2021. All I read was they were totally out of control. You couldn't get to a hospital. Well, apparently many people were concerned and didn't go to a hospital because there were so many COVID patients. You don't want to breathe that recirculating air. And I understand that uh, in a hospital. Obviously, folks, where I knew this was going is you didn't take your mammogram. You didn't get a colonoscopy. And now the hospitals are swamped with people who should have been seeing a doctor regularly and didn't because you were afraid walking into a medical office or a doctor's office was going to hurt you or give you a disease. And I, there's one, months of treatment delays have exasperated chronic conditions and worsened symptoms. Doctors and nurses say the severity of illness ranges widely and includes abdominal pain, imagine that, respiratory problems, blood clots, heart conditions, hmm, and suicide attempts, among others. So in other words, I'm wondering, how come all these people, what, how come all these people are in hospitals now? I don't know. But they say it's because they haven't kept their cancer commitments to their mammograms and their pap smears and so forth. Wow, so much going on out there. So much going on out there. <clears throat> oh no, SL, I didn't even know that. And I'm having lunch with him next week. I was so disappointed to learn that Dr. McKesh retired. I wish I could have consulted with him. He still has his website up. Did someone take over his practice? Yes, and apparently Bennett tells me he's a really great guy. He's like-minded to Dr. Mukesh. I believe he's an Indian doctor. Um, and he, first of all, Dr. Sarai is one of the brightest guys I ever met. He believes in Ayurvedic approaches to illness. He believes in curcumin. Um, he was dispensing natural supplements to his patients long ago. He met me years ago. I was the keynote speaker at a, I don't know what the meeting was on, but my talk was on cancer and fungus. And uh, afterwards, that day, I got the nicest note from him after my lecture. You have changed my practice, my life, and my patients. That was fun. That was Wasn't that, that fun? You were, there. you were there. That's yeah. right. Kyle was there. I was with you when he met you. Oh, it's just, at any rate, um, I knew he was going to, he's got grandkids now. Did you see this little grandbaby? Pardon? Oh, John, he has darling grandkids. Oh, my gosh. And he, he had told us, you know, he's thinking about slowing things down. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. What I would do, SL, is, look, I'm going to become your patient. I'm going to spend money. Here's what I need to know. I know that Dr. Mukesh used to prescribe Ayurvedic supplements, um, you know, just 
this new doctor do this also? I know that Doug and Dr. Soraya, Dr. Mukesh Soraya, um, were collaborating in research. And Dr. Mukesh found huge numbers. I'm talking 90% of the uh, bronchoscopies he did found fungus, not bacteria. And yet if you go to a pulmonary doctor with a cough, you're going on an antibiotic. Let's get right back to the urinary tract infection. Everybody gets, it's robotic, folks. These, med these drug company medical schools taught your doctor that. Give them an antibiotic and they're gonna get an antibiotic. I would question, look, everything's changing for a reason. I think you and I are in a better position not to barter, they're the doctor, they're smart, but tell them for once where your heart is. And that takes more than 11 seconds. I read you that paper two years ago. We on average in 2019 got 11 seconds to talk to a doctor. One of the hundreds of reasons I don't go. Nobody's going to charge me that money and talk to me for 11 or hear me for 11 seconds and then pull out a pen and start writing scripts. Ain't going to happen. Okay? So I think, SL, what I would do is contact the doctor who moved into his practice and I hear, I've heard good things about him. And I'd say, Are you like Dr. Soraya? Um, yeah, that's what I do. Olaf from Lisbon, I love that. I was wondering, Mark, <laughs> I was wondering what the Kaufman household hands out to kiddos on Halloween night. Little, <laughs> little packs of beta-glucan. I should do that, Mark. That's it. And, and when, you know, Cindy said she hands out tablets. Do you remember years ago when it got dangerous, people were putting pins? What kind of nutballs are out there in candy for kids? Um, if their parents only knew if their parents only knew that they might not have to go to a doctor every week or two if they were on these. Good question. What do we pass out? Um, Ruth shops only at uh, health-oriented stores, only buys organic food. We don't eat out at a restaurant. Here we move. Two sets come, cute as can be. But we're kind of out rural at the lake, uh, and, and so not many people come by. Um, Barbie says, Doug, can you talk about CPAP machines? Um, so purportedly, people who snore, I had a friend who had his uvula cut out, a uvulectomy, because he snored. And I said, did, did it fix it? No, I still snore. But folks, we tend to listen to that and shake our heads. No doctor held my friend down, opened his mouth and did that without his full acknowledgement that he wanted that done. Now he may have sold him a bill of goods. Um, a CPAP machine adds oxygen to your body and because you exhale in it, it's vulnerable to mold growth. I find this fascinating, folks, fascinating. They got these actors on TV talking about their CPAP machines. You now can, you know, put this stuff in it and shake it up, let it run during the day, and in an hour it just cleans all that mold out of there. Where'd that mold come from? Your exhalation. <sighs> you mean you're ex exhaling mold and you wonder why you're snoring? Could it be that you have inhaled a lot of mold? CPAP machines, gosh, I'm the wrong guy to talk with about that. Um, so many medical devices, I'm just the wrong guy. I don't know what my future holds, but my present and my past don't hold medical intervention. And I acknowledge some people may be deficient in oxygen, and maybe this is a good way to get oxygen into them, um, but I would sure like to be one of those people, Barbie, and let them have this 72-year-old codger and let me be them for six months. And I think with a good jogging program, I think with the right supplements, pulmonary, cardiovascular, uh, I think I would not need a CPAP machine afterwards. Okay, That's just what my heart tells me to tell you on that. 
Is it okay to cheat every Halloween, <laughs> Jack? I give away pencils. <laughs> but I'm so ugly, the kids give me candy. <laughs> uh, is it okay to cheat every Halloween? I've been on, you know, the diet for so long. Uh, I don't call it cheating. I never did. When the, the doctor's patients used to come back and see me at the hospital, um, you know, some of them would have their head in their hands and, you know, roll up the sleeve and it's bleeding again, the psoriasis. And I said, wow, what happened? Do you remember Jimmy Swagger and I have sinned? Um, they, they look at me and said, Doug, there was a Dr. Pepper at a 7-Eleven store with my name on it. I didn't do it. It popped itself open and it put itself in my mouth. Um, this is what I call challenging. How I have urinary tract infections, let's say. Let's start, uh, let's carry on where we started today. Doug, I have urinary tract infections. I'm gonna follow your diet, I'm gonna get on antifungals. Man, they're gone for two years. Debbie says, my urinary tract infection is gone. I think Debbie knows how to bring it back. A couple nights of wine, a bunch of candy bars, ice cream bars, it's hot outside. All of that would yield an infection, which would mean an antibiotic. So sugar and mycotoxins just load inside your body, and that's a vicious cycle Debbie knows that would be recreated, okay? From time to time, especially when I'm traveling, we go into a health food store halfway to Hill Country, and it's a great health food store, and they have carob-coated almonds. <clears throat> I'm always worried, why? Do the ones that are ugly and are moldy, are they the ones that get chocolate on them or carob? I'm always paranoid about that stuff. Thank you, John. Um, but I'll get some carob-coated almonds, and I'll be very careful to kind of suck the carob off them and then crunch them and sometimes look at them if they don't taste just right. I call that challenging. If I get sick after challenging, I surmise from that the program's still working. I'm just going to avoid that. And in a few weeks, I'll go to a friend's house. He'll have potato chip dip, and I'll say, lovely. And I'll have a few of those. Um, and... There's a few things I won't do. I, I won't do alcohol. I will not do alcohol. This is a time in my wife and my life where we should sit out. We, we have this beautiful uh, screened-in area that looks out at the deer and the world. Um, and early in the morning, we'll get up and make a cup of coffee and sit there. And it's so quiet and birds and, you know, it's, it's just amazing. This would be the time in my life when Ruth and I uh, might have a glass of wine at night, especially after sitting with the grandkids, right? Um, we know because I lectured doctors. I was so nervous. I lectured oncologists. They got continuing medical education from hearing me talk about what alcohol does. It's a mycotoxin. It's neurotoxic. You don't believe me? Drink a six-pack and give me a buzz, okay, because you got a buzz. So there's a few things I just won't do. I'm no longer into commercial candies. I would no more, what do I, ah. John, do you know what an Almond Joy is? You remember those? Sometimes you feel like a nut. That's exact. I used to have a propensity for Almond Joys and uh, I would no more. Now an Almond Joy that used to cost a nickel, you know, when I was a kid, they have something similar to it, and I kind of like it. It's a coconut, real coconut, real coconut fat with carob on it. And that thing is $2.40. But I'm going to eat one of them a month. So, sure, uh, in answer to your question, Jack, is it okay to cheat every once in a while? Yeah, it is. And like I said, you always want to test the candy you're giving to the children beforehand. Look, um, if you have trick-or-treaters and you want to give them a goodie, so be it. It's their parents' responsibility to see that they don't eat too much of it. Okay? We always hid in our bedroom. Wow. And thank you, Doug, for allowing us to pick your brain. Not much left of it, so pick, pick, pick. What do you recommend for someone who has bronchial spasms brought on by shortness of breath 
headaches and a cough. <clears throat> and what started this? You hear me, I just did it. <clears throat> Ever since I had COVID two years ago now, I've had this thickness. And uh, what I've done is gotten a little uh, uh, nebulizer and I use that and it helps tremendously. But when I talk for hours and hours and hours, as I do, it begins coming back. Um, I have no SOB, shortness of breath. I don't have bronchial spasms. It feels like hanging on my uvula is a chunk of mucus and I can't seem to get rid of it. Headaches I don't have. So, and um, shortness of breath, headache and a cough. Bronchial spasms. Um, here's what I would do if I were you. I would give the Kaufman diet and I would give something called, well, what did I do with the sheet? I had a bottle of it right here. Here it is. <clears throat> this, I think, is a roll bottle. The caprylic acid. Visit or call 1-888-541-3997. Frank has been an advertiser with me <clears throat> for 25 years. I have his phone number memorized. He has a product called Caprylic Acid Plus, Caprylic Plus. You cannot believe the ingredients. Antiparasitic like black walnut. Uh, antifungal, it's a dynamic, inexpensive product. I would, for 30 days, I would follow the Kaufman diet and take these as directed. 31 days, I'd drop back and grade myself. How would I do that? As I used to introduce to all the doctor's patients, I would challenge. Doug, I feel better than I've felt my entire life at 31 days when we'd see them. We'd see them at 14 and then 31 days. <clears throat> uh, what now? What do you want? I really miss my wine and I miss potatoes. Okay, go home tonight, uh, make a burger patty and have a potato, and have a glass of wine. Inevitably, when they'd come back a month later, they'd say, boy, have I learned in the past month what I can do and what I can't. The Kaufman diet answers a lot of questions. Is fungus the cause of everything? I don't think so. I think it's the cause of most things. And I think it's totally overlooked in medical training. Totally. A mycologist is a guy who got his PhD looking at yeast and smuts and spores and, and uh, mushrooms. Mycologists don't practice medicine, although I think they'd be much better than many of our physicians today because they know mold, mildew, and fungus. Okay, that's what I would do. If I had this condition going on, uh, I would opt a couple of safe, inexpensive supplements, olive leaf extract, things like that. <clears throat> if it were bronchial spasms, I'd try a nasal spray before you go to bed at night. There are a lot of good ones, antifungal, and I'd change my diet. <clears throat> Shahuba, good to see you again in here. Hi, Doug, what would you suggest taking to replace antibiotics that the dentist prescribes for after getting a tooth pulled. Mm, I might take antibiotics. When you get, um, if you've had an extraction, obviously, there's a time and a place for antibiotics. We are currently using them non-judiciously. That was brought up decades ago in medical circles, pediatric journals, internal medicine. They're all saying, gosh, we're not using antibiotics judiciously. And the yawn is surrounding, well, they don't hurt anybody. They have no idea that increased intake of antibiotics equals increased risk of the most common cancers and many other things, tummy problems, that we humans have. No idea. You think they're teaching that in continuing medical education? Not. Because you know who gives continuing medical education? Thank you. The pharmaceutical company. You don't want to shoot the goose that's producing the golden egg. I would take the antibiotic. I think antibiotics can be rendered fairly harmless if you'll always, not once, not 10 times, always chase an antibiotic with a probiotic, with a good probiotic. And even psyllium, P-S-Y-L-L-I-U-M, psyllium holes, right? Like Poop Doc, one of my clients, one of my advertisers here. I love this guy. Daily fiber. This is blonde psyllium. Such good stuff. Inexpensive, 
Poop Doc Daily Fiber. Take a scoop of this, put it in a jar of water, shake it up quick because it'll harden. Drink it down quick. Uh, maybe take a caprylic acid and a probiotic and boom, go to sleep. Okay? Uh, this binds mycotoxins, fungal poisons, antibiotics are mycotoxins. It binds onto them in the gut. It encourages uh, bowel movements, right? And there it goes, the mycotoxins. So these aren't things your standard gastroenterologist will tell you about. <clears throat> but that's what I would do. I would take the antibiotic. You're talking about a dirty socket. Maybe that's the reason the tooth has to come out. That can be real bad. So I would take the antibiotic. Thank you, Shahuba. <clears throat> Lisa says, hi, Doug. My husband has asthma and a consistent hacking cough. We know our pulmonologist for 30 years. We go back and forth with steroids and an occasional antibiotic, and I hate it because I don't know how to go about approaching him when asking him about an antifungal approach. I just don't know where to start, and I thought, uh, where to start? You know, I bought your books years ago, right around the time that I began having many surgeries for many different things, but thank God that's all behind me now, and I hope, I just want to concentrate <clears throat> on my husband's lung situation. Any suggestions would be greatly appreciated, Doug. And thank you for the comments thereafter. This is fascinating. I don't know where you are, Lisa, but here's what I would recommend. I mean, Dr. Mukesh and I, I've got to tell you something. It's a high for me. When I began, I remember my early work with Dr. Howard Godshock in California. I got back from Vietnam. He hired me because I was trained in emergency medicine. And when you're doing allergy tests on people, anaphylaxis can be real. We saw it once. Uh, you can put a tiny aliquot, a tiny amount of ragweed in someone if they're highly sensitive IgE antibodies, too technical, histamine release, they can fall over and die. Test them for peanut or something horrible. So that's why Howard hired me. <clears throat> and one day one of his patients who didn't come in for his allergy shots, the deal was we're going to scratch your back and your arms and we're going to tell you what you're allergic to, and then we'll bottle up a relieving dose, right? And every couple times a week you come in, we were either 4 or $7 per shot. There'd be a whole waiting room full of people waiting to get, hi, Doug, how you doing? Good. How's the allergy shot working? Well, it's not working yet, but never thought of diet, folks. Never. I was, brand, I was a neophyte, brand new at this. <clears throat> and that engineer from, I think it was Boeing, came in and said his mom aged milk. Here's the way I thought at 23 years old. I thought when he opened that cellophane, it'd be flies on it, you know, aged milk. The word yogurt hadn't been invented 50 years ago, uh, or it wasn't in, in my vocabulary. And it looked like cottage cheese, and he took a couple of tablespoons. He kept it in his refrigerator, and he took a couple of tablespoons in the morning, a couple of tablespoons in the evening. Then why are you here? Do you need a shot? No. I just felt it on my heart to tell you that. A guardian angel, right? Um, and it, it, he never came back. Probiotics, lactobacillus acidophilus, antifungal, right? And then Bob, the pharmacist downstairs in Dr. Godshock's building, uh, Dr. Godshock saw yeast. He had this metal suction device, and he got a big clump of yeast out of somebody's nose. And he asked Bob if he could grind up Nystatin. That was a drug 50 years ago. If he could grind it up and put it in ocean spray, ocean water, so saline, normal saline, and put a couple pills in there in the patient. And this patient said that she couldn't even breathe. For years, she hadn't been able to breathe. Now, nobody at that time questioned were you living in a moldy home. But I'll be darned, once she started the nice statin nasal spray, she could breathe. So tap, I felt the Lord, you know, hey, Doug. And then the guy, who Disney uh, artist who lived in a, at that time, a $500,000 home overlooking the ocean, <laughs> $50 million home today, who was very sick with sinus problems. And I asked him if he'd go to Big Bear. You know these stories, right? Big Bear was, as the crow flies, 130 miles from where he lived, but it's way up high. It was snowing. And, uh, and I 
came up with the idea his home was making him sick. Could there be mold? Does mold grow in a home? That's where many of you are today. Thank you for joining me. I was there. Uh, mold really grows in a home very, very well, and you got to take care of it. <clears throat> so all of this leads me to, to try and answer that. When Dr. McKesh met me, his mind was blown. I'd never seen a doctor. All of a sudden, folks, I get calls from physicians who have a difficult patient or a loved one with a lump uh, or a, a situation, and they want, they're asking me what to do. My wife and I are always so humbled when I'll get one of those calls in the evening. Look, I never had an ego. I, I don't want a big head. I never, I see now what I'm supposed to be doing. And it makes me so excited when a physician who's been through all of that wants to know what to do about a lump uh, in his son's groin. I mean, what an honor. So if I were you, Dr. McKesh was a pulmonologist. First thing you need to do is ask that wonderful pulmonologist who's a friend of yours for 30 years, Lisa, if he would do a bronchoscopy. Most pulmonologists do bronchoscopies to confirm their diagnosis of bacteria. Doctor, could you, or you know, listen, I might even have my friend call him, your pulmonologist. <clears throat> because candidly, he and I were blown away. We thought maybe 60% of all chronic uh, uh, events were fungus. 90 plus of hundreds of bronchoscopies that he did. And I wish he'd have published that before he retired, but I know that was information he wanted to prove what I was saying at that lecture. I would ask the doctor to do a bronchoscopy and have it tested for a dozen of the most common fungi and their mycotoxins. That can be done. Um, and any pulmonologist should know how to do this because they're all looking for bacteria. Ask the doctor to check for fungus. By the way, thanks John. Once fungus, this guy, he seems to make sense. Thank you, John. Uh, know the cause, uh, right down there, uh, doctor's fungal protocol, <clears throat> print that, there it is, John, thank you. And uh, the doctor will like it because it's referenced, scientifically referenced, and most of the times, the doctor will prescribe an antifungal. Why? Not because of Doug Kaufman, it's because his own Center for Disease Control is now telling physicians to think fungus. <clears throat> That's huge. Okay, let's see, we got that done, we got all those done, thank you. <laughs> hey Zeus, I love your show. Is there a fungus link for male pattern baldness, testosterone in the endocrine system? It's really a good thought, hey Zeus. What, what would impede the endocrine system to back off on testosterone or any you know, male or female hormone because fungi are endocrine disruptors? Hmm. Wouldn't this be cool, Jesus, if you could, a year, and let me tell you what I used to recommend. We had people with seborrheic dermatitis when I worked at the doctor's office decades ago. And uh, I, seborrheic dermatitis, it bleeds, it's dandruff uh, that, ooh, it was really bad. I didn't know much about it before I moved to Texas, but it really was ugly. It looked like psoriasis on their scalp. So some of them would take a razor and cut around it and it was, it was tough. Uh, so one day I walked in and Dr. Weekly was talking to the doctor who invented head and shoulder shampoo. They were friends. They were both on a many uh, dermatology boards together. And I heard this guy say, uh, Dave, you know, I patented, I, I put an antifungal medication in head and shoulder shampoo. I was just crossing through, just handing him a couple charts and I thought, fascinating. So when head and shoulders shampoo, and I know you're not talking about seborrheic dermatitis, but you may be talking about another fungal condition, but remember, the hair grows from inside out, okay? So you had to fix inside. Um, but what I used to tell people was to take head and shoulder shampoo, pour a little of it out, put 10 to 15 drops of melaleuca plant, a tea tree oil in it, 
shake it before each use, lather, and leave on for a few minutes. So wash everything else while your hair is still all lathered up. And I'll be darned if that didn't help people with seborrheic dermatitis more than just the head and shoulders alone. Sometimes that was a home run for these people. Tar shampoos, antifungal shampoos, <clears throat> but head and shoulders was good. When that didn't work, I asked them to add the melaleuca, and that seemed to work very well. Hey Zeus, if I were you, this is a new one for me, but certainly you hit the nail on the head. Thank you for watching. These fungi are endocrine disruptors. So I would follow a Kaufman diet for 30 days. I would wash my hair in case it's an on top problem. I would wash my hair with head and shoulder shampoo, leave on two, three minutes while you're showering, and then rinse off. And I would see if it's a plug problem. So in other words, the hair follicles are plugged and the head and shoulder shampoo with or without the melaleuca might help, or if it's an inside plug problem and you've got to change your diet, thereby getting your testosterone levels up and maybe growing hair. I hope this would be totally cool, Jesus, if two years from now online we could see Jesus's hats and you had antifungal herbs inside a hat that would encourage hair growth. Wouldn't that be cool? Thank you so much. Great to talk to you and thank you for being here. <clears throat> Aileen, hi Doug, today I was visiting a neighbor. We were talking about how her daughter had passed away from lung cancer, wow. <clears throat> she was in her 30s, a marathon runner, perfect health. One day she started to, have, uh, to clear her throat throughout the day and eventually got worse and worse and then her shoulder started hurting. She went to doctors for two years and they told her she was fine. Then she demanded a chest x-ray and they told her she had stage four lung cancer, passed away in eight months, so sad. I'm now convinced that after I got COVID, I'm now concerned that after I got COVID, I have to clear my throat several times a day. What do you think? <clears throat> An x-ray that's not true. An x-ray would see something atypical. Many, they're now saying these aspergillomas, these balls of aspergillus fungus, they grow in balls in the lungs, mimics lung cancer. So if you, gosh, Aileen, uh, um, get a chest x-ray. I have this too. <clears throat> This has been going on for a couple of years. The older I get, it progresses a little bit. Uh, when I get up in the morning, <clears throat> but nothing like many people's. Doug, I'm now concerned after I got COVID, I have to clear my throat several times a day. What do you think? Get an x-ray. Get an x-ray or a scan. Rule out there's something growing there. Now, if they tell you, Aileen, that boy, I don't like this, there's something growing there. Uh, they'll want to do a biopsy send it to mycology and look for aspergillus fungus. Is that an aspergilloma? There are medical reports, many of them, that should start with whoops. I told you about the journal lung, you guys can look this up, 2013. The journal lung referenced 27 diagnosed or primary or secondary uh, lung cancers. Primary would be, you know, kidney cancer that metastasize. Uh, primary would be lung, secondary would be kidney cancer that metastasized to the lungs. But 27 diagnosed with x-ray, medically worked up, this is cancer, who didn't have cancer. They started them on antifungal drugs and they all got better according to the Lung Journal 2013. Uh, so folks, it's out there. Mistakes are being made all the time and mm, man, that's a tough one, Aileen. Thank you for being there as her friend. Get a scan. Get a scan. I think more and more we are seeing we the people now taking charge of our own health and just walking into a doctor's office. Look, I'm a little frightened. I got a <clears throat> cough going on ever since I had COVID. Um, the cool news is I now have antibodies to COVID, uh, but there's something in my throat. There's something in my lungs. I just like a scan to see what it is or if it is something. Okay, I hope that helps. Um, <clears throat> Cora asks, what are the names of antifungal drugs? There's not many of them, Cora, which is fascinating. There are thousands of antibiotics, profitable. I don't know how many. There's a couple dozen that I know of antivirals. Uh, 
and there's a handful of antifungals. Let's get back, core to what they're taught in medical training. Everything is bacteria. So you'll need thousands of antibacterials. And all day, you better reach in and be writing. And little herpes one, herpes two, common cold. So virus is a COVID, virus is a problem. So we've got Zovirax and, you know, a couple dozen antivirals. But fungus doesn't cause problems. Because think about it this way. I'm, I'm your doctor telling you. If fungus caused problems, how many of you have taken antibiotics? Well, you'd be dead. So there aren't many antifungals out there. Um, and folks, that's just diametric to the way I believe. I think there should be thousands of antifungals. Oh, by the by, there are. It's called your food. So when you ask about what are the names of antifungals, start with kale. Start with broccoli. Start with carrot and tomatoes, lycopene. I mean, look up tonight, Cora, um, phytonutrients. Antifungal, antifungal, antifungal. So God put the food here for us to enjoy that kills fungus should we get into it. Thank you. We're doing good, John. <clears throat> Um, but there are antifungal drugs, the two we overused when I was working with the doctors. You remember, I had to learn this because uh, they didn't know about antifungal drugs. The two, now yeah, that's not true. There's some very good early ones, Griseofoldman, Amphotericin B, Ketoconazole. These are the early generation uh, antifungal drugs. We had a problem with them because they didn't circulate out of the body. They kind of stayed in the liver. And we'd end up with what we call hepatotoxicity. So along came these newer azole drugs or different classes of antifungal drugs. And they're the Sporinox, Lamisil, uh, Diflucan, etc. that uh, don't sit in the liver. Oops. Yeah. Sit in the liver. Um, they are washed out via the bloodstream, out of the body, right, and the gut. So these are a little bit safer. Uh, Diflucan is on target for killing yeast. Yeast, like Cryptococcus neoformans, this is bird dropping, much like histoplasma. Uh, Candida albicans, Candida tropicalis, there's 20 or so Candidas. Diflucan is good for vaginal yeast infections, thrush, oral thrush. When we know we have a yeast problem in our body or on our skin, the doctor will give you Diflucan. It comes in 50 milligrams, 100, 150, 200, or IV. Uh, and then there's the unknown etiology. You know, gosh, this guy's getting bloody noses, and fungus causes those. See, getting bloody noses and having horrible problems. I don't know which fungus it is. I can send it off and have a culture send it out to a lab, and it's going to take a month to get it back. I want to start them on something now, Doug. I would use Sporinox, itraconazole. And by the way, I may have been right way back then. I may have been right way back then because Sporinox, you now see, is helping patients with COVID. Isn't that a virus? Spornox is helping people with cancer. Spornox is helping people with toenail fungus. So Spornox I really, really like. Um, so those are the antifungals, but remember, let food be your medicine. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, said that. Let food be your medicine, and medicine will become your food. Alice, you ask a good question. I'll be more, um, let me just answer it. Uh, I don't think we know all we need to know, and uh, I'd be cautious, and I am. I hope you know where I'm going with that. Uh, Cindy asks, the commercial food quality has really gone down the past three or four years. Very difficult to me to find anything to eat now. Cindy, thank you for bringing that up. Man, you, you hit home runs on every one of my shows. One of the reasons... I've been blessed, Cindy. I, I could stay here at the lake. I could move back to L.A., which uh, with my son and his wife, she is pregnant, going to deliver our first baby girl around Christmas time, and I miss them so much. Um, I, I could slow down my work and, and go out there. 
one of the reasons, one of the things I looked for, my prerequisite, was to have land. Because uh, if you got a backyard, you got and dirt, you got the potential of planting seeds. And uh, I, I don't think there's any emergency for this, but I've done that. My grandparents did this. They used to grow tomatoes and rhubarb and strawberries and things out in California many years ago. And I really like that idea. I like self-sustaining. I like, um, you know, getting an old tractor that could dig a hole and plant things, and harvest them, and going out watering them uh, in my old age. I, I know where you're going with this. And, um, it, you know, I would, uh, many people have herb gardens. Our daughters have, herb, our daughter-in-laws have herb gardens, and they're wonderful. But at some time, I'd kind of like to grow my own. I'd like to get some fruit trees. Uh, temperatures aren't such, you know, it's 110 in the summer, and it'll go down below zero in the winter out here some years, or below 32 anyway, it'll freeze. Um, so that's one of my prerequisites. And we found this home in the hill country, it's got acreage. And I'm already tilling, I, I'm excited about it. I, I think someday I'd like to grow my own. Wouldn't that be great to go out and, and pick a squash, a couple of tomatoes, and that's what you're going to have for dinner that night. Um, so that's, that's a good point, very good point. So uh, my pituitary adenoma is three centimeters. Do you think surgery or medication? So it's a, uh, adenoma is a benign tumor on the pituitary gland, okay? Um, do you think surgery or medication? Okay, here, thank you. You see, I think we're steering this ship now. Some people, some people want a lipoma, a fatty. I used to have one right here or here on my face a couple years ago. You've been with me. And I just had it cut out. Why? I didn't like the way it looked. You can't see your pituitary adenoma. But I sense there's part of you that kind of wants it gone. It's a big surgery. But I understand that. Because, Doug, I don't know if I can live. They're telling me currently it's benign, but like a polyp. This could go on to become to hyperdevelop and become something worse. So I kind of like the idea. If only we had a zipper. If only we could just unzip and take it out and zip back up, you know. Uh, but you can't, and it's a it's not as major as it used to be. This surgery, but uh, surgery or medication? Where's your heart? I. So many women came to me with breast cancer. And my advice, it had not metastasized. But it was a lump and it was getting better and they kept an eye on it, which is good. What would you do, Doug? Okay, I'm the kind of guy that would, since it's local, under the nipple, I'm the kind of guy that would say, Let's take it out because when I wake up or when the anesthesia wears off, I know I get a do-over. No more cancer in my body. And if this is something that's concerning you that much, and it is, I might opt to have it taken out. Remember, medication doesn't fix problems. Medication maintains it fixes the symptoms, but the problem doesn't go away. Most Americans are on statin maintenance. Boy, that was a home run for the drug companies. I hope that helps. Oh, listen, Alice. Years ago, I'd give kids raisins at Halloween. It wasn't too popular. <laughs> did you have bags on fire on your porch when you did that? <laughs> Little did I know raisins. <laughs> like a little shot of mole. <laughs> uh, raisins. We tried that one year in California. In California, we lived at the beach. And it, I'm telling you, if we had 100 kids, it would start at dusk. The cutest. I love when they're two years old or three years old. I, I just love that. Good for you, Alice. Um, uh, hemifacial spasms. Uh, it, it, or a movement disorder, uh, Rose, is there help for it? 
you would have laughed. All of you would have died laughing if you could have sat on my shoulder and saw me. They would hand me, uh, I'm on these seven drugs. Like I knew what, how do you spell, what, why is a Z and a Y and a K and a U next to each other? That's a drug? And they'd say, should I continue on these? I don't know, we're going to go talk to the doctor. And then they'd say, I also have hemifacial spasms. What? Yeah. Oh, good. John, put that up. Okay, there's a hemifacial. Thank you, John. Good for you. Okay, there's a hemifacial spasm. And Rose wants to know if there's any help for that. Um, folks, what, what would cause nerves to do that? What would cause synapses to break apart like that? What causes that? Does bacteria? Do bacterial toxins? I, I don't know. Rose... Um, so, um, I tell you, I, I, would, I would use garlic supplements. I'd put garlic on every salad you make, right? Uh, I would use, uh, garlic is a great chelator uh, uh, in the body. I would use caprylic acid. I would go on the Kaufman diet. Folks, here's what most people don't get. And I didn't get it. I'm right, and I didn't get it for a decade. You can get it right away. <clears throat> I laughed at myself in 1974 thinking that food could reverse a disease. And then I found myself a couple years ago speaking at Ty and Charlene's uh, The Truth About Cancer, speaking about diet and cancer. So I've come full cycle. Many of you, because your doctors don't understand this, many of you can't get on board with this. Rose, imagine if, if I had that problem and I changed my diet and I took a picture with my cell phone every day in my mirror and in 17 days I saw it beginning to clear up. Let food be your medicine. Cough out. And sometimes it takes several coughs. Please tell me more about the nebulizer and how you use it. So a nebulizer, before you, you can get these at a uh, where do you get drugs? A drugstore. <laughs> um, I get birthday cards and things like that. But you get one of these little nebulizers and you can put, you know, oils in it, oregano, etc. And you just breathe. It nebulizes and it gets into your lungs. Um, in the old days, those of you in the medical field, I uh, rotated through uh, res respiration. I became a respiratory therapist uh, in the Navy. And we used to do what's called IPPB treatments. Do you remember those? Thank you. IPPB stands for Intermittent Positive Pressure Breathing. Intermittent Positive Pressure Breathing. And we used an acetal or uh, some uh, vasodilator we would use. Now there are many herbs that can do the same thing. Um, yeah, Mary, it sounds like a lot of people coming off COVID ended up, I'm one of them, with a lump that needs to come up. Never had this before, but it's part and parcel to whatever this bug is. Um, a nebulizer, it, when I got, I got my nebulizer from Dr. Mukesh, <clears throat> and he explained it to me. It's important when you get one to talk to the pharmacist. Okay, how do I use this? How often do I use it? What do you recommend? that I use in it. That's what I tell people. Go to the pharmacy and ask them. IBS issues. I know diet is important. What's a good starter protocol? Okay, Pam. Um, if you always do what you've always done, expect the same results. So if the diet is static, I eat cereal in the morning, two cups of coffee. For lunch, I'll have a sandwich with some friends. At dinner, I have a cold beer, just one. The doctor said, just hold it to one. And I'll have a steak on some nights, chicken, fish, a protein source, etc. You, In order to change, you have to start with your diet. Um, especially, IBS stands for irritable bowel. And there are many sub-fractions of irritable bowel. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and the list is almost endless. Your bowel isn't irritable. You're irritable because your bowel is mad, okay? Um, you got to start at the beginning. 
you have to change diet. I would recommend salads and soups, um, you know, for a period of time. Intermittent fasting, I really like for people with IBS. I really love what I showed you earlier. Get, it's inexpensive. Get a jar of this, it's a fiber. This one I haven't opened yet. This is my, I always have one at home and one here. Um, but this is just a fiber with a scoop in it. Put it in a glass of water, a jar of water with the lid, shake it up well, shoot it down before you go to bed. This binds antibiotics and other mycotoxins from his diet. Corn, wheat, peanuts have mycotoxins, or some of them do. So cleanse the bowel. If you can, Pam, pick up my Fungus Link 1 book. Dr. Dave Holland and I, a physician and I, spoke at a little hospital out here 25 years ago on irritable bowel. And we met a couple of, they were both men, we met a whole bunch of patients, but we met a couple of men who, uh, really changed our thinking. They followed our program and their reports are in the book. And then while I was there, I picked up uh, from the hospital we were in what to do for IBS. Don't kid yourself that diet plays any role in IBS. Uh, not any role, every role in IBS. Pam, I hope that helps, that's what I do. Wow, Louie, thankfully put down my cigarettes after 40 years. Doctor wants me to have a lung scan to look only for cancer, not having any issues in my opinion to have this test. I would like your thoughts. Uh, chlorophyll. Hmm. Remember yesterday, were you watching, Louie, when I drank the sweet wheat? Man, if I was a past smoker, I would be using a scoop of sweet wheat every morning, maybe every night before you go to bed. Um, this is a, a blood cleanser, uh, organic wheatgrass juice, and uh, uh, and here again, doctor wants me to have a lung scan. Sure as I would tell you, nah, or your heart's telling you, nah. The doctor is, uh, they're, they're pretty anally retentive this way. He probably just wants to make sure you're okay. I wouldn't object to a simple scan. I know ionizing radiation, mammograms, and so forth uh, scare people. But if this is a good doctor, I do it for him. Insurance will pay for it, I do it for him and you'll probably sleep better with it. <clears throat> now other things, you know, I've never had a colonoscopy. Um, I hope to never have to have a colonoscopy, but I don't put alcohol in my colon. I don't put a mycotoxin, I don't put antibiotics in my colon. I don't put drugs in my colon. Um, so uh, that's, you know, my argument. But if this is a good doctor, you've enjoyed him for years and years and years and you did smoke, you know, I'd, I'd uh, I'd probably do it if he wanted me to do it, but really study. What's sweet wheat? Is it uh, su uh, sweet KTC? Sweet, S W E E T, sweet KTC dot com. Get information on that. You don't have to buy it, just study it. There it is, uh, sweet KTC dot com. Sensitivity to dust in the bedroom or in the house. Yeah, so dust, remember what dust is. We always used to test on people's backs and their arms for dust. And then one day I asked one of the chemists at Hollister Steer Laboratories. They were in Northern California. What is dust? Well, it's bits of mold. It's bits of carpet filament. It's bits of, car, uh, uh, you know, old uh, wallpaper. Sensitivity to dust in the bedroom or in the house. Get an air purifier. Best things in the world. We keep one in the master bedroom. Ooh, thank you so much. Nebulizing Amphotericin B is one of the most powerful ways to detox aspergillosis out of the lungs. Thank you, and I agree with that. Problem is, how do you get Amphotericin B? Um, you know, I know how I can get some of these natural things, but Amphotericin B is a drug. But thank you so much, and I totally concur with you. Thank you. <clears throat> What is the name, uh, Tyr says, what is the name of the stuff you said to put in head and shoulders and how do you spell the name and where is the best place to get it? Um, so Melaleuca plant uh, is what I used to recommend, tea tree oil, T-E-A, tea, tree, like this. Hmm, that looks good. Tea tree oil or Melaleuca. 
I would use head and shoulder shampoo by itself. I saw miracles happen for seborrheic dermatitis. <clears throat> when I didn't, sometimes they fall through the crack. They did it, it didn't work. And the few that I recommended, Melaleuca, 10, 15, maybe 20 drops, and you have to shake it because that stuff will end up on the top. So you have to shake it before each use. And then my claim to fame was lather and leave while you're cleaning the rest of your body. And then hose it down, you know, stand under the shower, make sure it's all gone. Um, and then I even had a, I, I had one of his, uh, the doctor's patients, take thyme oil, T-H-Y-M-E oil, rub it in his hands, and then put it in his scalp before he combed his hair. And it was amazing. He had bleeding seborrheic dermatitis. Folks, do me a favor, Radical Resilience Health Conference, that's my friend Dr. Lee Cowdens. Uh, think about, it's coming up November 6th, uh, and they still have a discount. This is gonna be a physical, emotional, and spiritual restoration. Lee's got some fascinating, a nurse, a couple of doctors, friends of his talking at this thing, and I think it's well worth your attendance. It's all online. Uh, Radical Resilience, Dot health, radical resilience dot health. Now it's my time to thank Damon and John and all of you for joining us. Off to Hill Country, but I'll be back Tuesday. God bless.